Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming to hear about chemical computing, which is kind of cool. And I'm really excited to share that with you. All right. Well, let's get into it then. Um, so first, this presentation is rated G for general programmers. However, there is a small disclaimer. There will be intense sequences of Lisp code. So <laughs> you've been warned. Uh, this paper, uh, this uh, presentation is also starring the papers of chemical computing by Peter Dittrich, higher order chemical programming style. And I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing these names right, but I'll do my best. J.P. Banatra, P. Frede, and uh, Y. Radinick. Also, another paper by them is Principles of Chemical Programming, and also Programming Self-Organizing Systems with the Higher Order Chemical Language. I will be your narrator. I am Karen Meyer. I'm also known on the internet as GigaSquid, and I have recently written a book by O'Reilly called Living Closure that is a gentle introduction to the closure programming language. So you can check it out. And I also work at Cognitect. So if you've ever come to any of my talks before, you know that I like to kind of start things off with a little story. So this talk is uh, no different. So this starts off with a little story of me cutting my lawn. I live in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, um, by a river. And uh, it's a little bit rural. I have chickens. And as a result, I have a rather large lawn to mow. So I have a riding lawn mower. And I ride around on it, and it takes me a few hours to actually get it cut. But I really cherish this time, because this is time that I can just unplug and be off of the internet and all the other distractions, and actually just think about things. So I usually like to prime myself before I go out and uh, mow the lawn, and you know, maybe pick up a, a, a programming problem. And on this particular day, I had just gotten this new cool book called um, Unconventional Programming Paradigms by Springer. Fabulous book. And in it, there is a section of uh, papers on this thing called chemical programming or chemical computing. So I just like skimmed over it really quickly, and I started riding the lawnmower and just thinking about this. Uh, so one more thing to let you know about my lawn and my lawn mowing is I usually wear a big hat because I have you know, fair skin and I burn easily, so I wear a big hat to cover my head. And this works great, except in the case of tree branches. Because when I have this big thing over my head, I sometimes misjudge the distance of going under the tree branch. And in this particular day, I did misjudge it, and I bonked my head. And everything went blank, just for a second. But when, when it came back, like everything was like fuzzy, like with all those like little dots, you know? It's like after you hit your head. <laughs> and in this moment, you know, brains are funny things. I, I think I still had a set of neurons thinking about chemical programming and what this means. And I saw these dots all at the same time and I saw them all over the grass. And I just thought, whoa, the grass is computing. And then I looked at the tree, and I was like, whoa, the tree is computing. And I looked at my hands and the dots over, like, I am computing. And, and this is true. Uh, you know, the grass is computing. The tree is computing. You are computing. Uh, all living things process information uh, with chemical reactions on a molecular level. Uh, I mean, we do this all the time with our endocrine system, with hormones. Uh, our immune system does this with adapted defense. Uh, even just small, sim simple bacteria, they do signal processing of information. So we're computing all the time, and the world is computing all around us. So with this thought all in my mind, I, I went back in the house and put some ice on my head. <laughs> but, um, so wait, I know you're thinking. You're thinking, are we going to be actually programming with chemicals in this talk? So no, although that would be super cool too. Um, 
So in this talk, we're going to be talking about abstract chemicals. We're going to actually be using the metaphor of molecule, molecules and reactions to do computing, which is really cool in itself, too. So wait. What am I going to get out of this talk? Here's the exciting part. You ready? I don't know. <laughs> and that's really awesome, because this talk is uh, it's about cross-fertilization. It's about cross-fertilization from two very different fields, from computer programming and from nature and biology. And when you take two different fields like this and see what you can learn from them, you get all sorts of research, you get new ideas, and this is really where innovation comes from, this space. And uh, I will tell you, that chemical computing and chemical programming right now is only in the research domain. I talked to one of the authors of the paper, and there's nothing in the wild that he knows of yet. And this is really exciting in itself, because you all are you know, extremely smart people out there, and I'm excited to see, you know, when you listen to this, what might inspire you. So let's talk about chemical programming. At the heart of it all is all about the reaction. So it's kind of hard to explain uh, without seeing one way versus another way of doing things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to compare two examples. We're going to look at calculating primes, the traditional way that we're all familiar with. And then we're going to compute primes with this new um, prime reaction way of um, thinking about things. So first, let's look at traditional primes. And this, wait. What is that language with all the parens? Some of you are thinking. This is closure. And the first thing, most important thing, uh, so how many people are familiar with closure? OK, great, great. A lot of people are. For the, but, but for the people that are seeing it for the first time, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to Closure, don't worry about the parens, really. They're OK once you get an editor and you know, it matches the parens and you can move back and forth. They really seem to disappear. So don't panic. The parens are OK. <laughs> so just a few words about closure as a language. Uh, it's a wonderful language. I really love it. Uh, it's dynamic. So if you're defining a cat, uh, you don't need to say what type it is. Um, it's functional. Here we are. We're defining a simple function. Say hello. Uh, it takes a parameter name that simply concatenates a string hello with the name. You invoke that function by putting it in the parens again say hello, and then a string molecule will return hello molecule. It runs on the JVM, so it also has Java interop, uh, very nice Java interop. Uh, in fact, the strings are just Java Lang strings if you're from the Java world, and you can invoke um, the methods on them. It supports concurrency, which is a wonderful thing as well. Uh, it's got immutable data, and it's got these things called VARs, RAFs, Atom, and Agents that I'm not going to go into, but I just wanted to mention them. And there's also this exciting thing called Closure Script now that lets Closure compile down to JavaScript and go anywhere JavaScript can go. It has all the same wonderful characteristics of Closure, but it also has JavaScript interrupt. All right. So going back to our example, let's go ahead and take a look at computing traditional primes in closure. So we would define a function to figure out whether something's prime or not. We'll call it is prime question mark, and we give it a number. So we could look at all the possible factors of this number um, from two up to the number, and then we can find its remainders. Um, you know, and we can see then are any of these remainders zero? If they're not then it's prime. So we could look as, is five prime? Yes. Is six prime? No. We can go one step farther, and we can figure out, generate some primes. So we can just take a range and, you know, from two up to 100, we can generate all these numbers, and then we can map this function, um, is prime over them, and filter out the ones that are only prime. And we're left with a list of primes up to 100. So yay. You know, this is all very comfortable and familiar. But how do we do it with a prime reaction? That's what we're interested in. So the first thing you might notice is I have balls on the screen. 
And this is to represent molecules. So we are going to think of these numbers, these integers, as molecules now, and they're going to react with each other. So if you have a six molecule reacting with a two molecule, we have a simple rule saying that if it's divisible, you can return a three and then the two. We can see this in code. You can take in a vector, um, a list of these two molecules. We'll call them A and B. And if A is greater than B, and if the mod of the two together are zero, then we would return back a vector of this A divided by B and the B. Otherwise, we'll just return unchanged the ones that came in. It would not react. So we could see the prime reaction of six and two would return a vector of three and two. And the prime reaction of five and two would just return unchanged that five and two. So then we can take, um, we can define a whole bunch of these molecules. Uh, and we could define another function that is going to mix and react these molecules. So first we shuffle them all up because we don't care what order they're in. And then we're going to partition them in twos. So go down the list and partition them in twos. And then we're just going to go ahead and make them all react in those pairs. And then we're just going to flatten out their return a vector, and that's going to be our result. So if we look at the first 10 from doing this mix and react, we can see, hmm, well, there definitely may be some primes here, but there's definitely not some primes here. So it's kind of hard to tell exactly. You know, it might be doing some work. So maybe we need to do this more times. We need to shuffle them up and mix them up and react them more times. So let's make another function called a reaction cycle. And we can do this n times. And what it's going to do is exactly that. It's just going to go ahead and mix and react them, mix and react them for n times. So we can go ahead and do this reaction cycle 100 times and then peek at the 10, first 10 results. And we get to see something that looks a lot more like primes resulting. So we can do this even more times. We can do this, what is that, 10,000 times. And we can take a measurement of our result. And our measurement is going to be, we're going to go ahead and uh, take out all the duplicates and sort them. And lo and behold, we actually get some primes. It may have taken us a little bit more time than the other way, but we actually came to it from a totally different angle. And this way that we did this actually has a name, and it's called gamma chemical programming. And it's composed of some things that we just did. Uh, it's got reaction rules, and they operate on multi-sets of elements. A reaction is composed of two parts, a condition plus an action. And then you execute these rules, and when you execute them, you replace the result elements with the original elements. Now here is the tricky part. <laughs> the result is the solution when it reaches steady state, and that's kind of hard to predict. <laughs> so we don't know exactly how many times we have to mix them. So let's look at another example of not primes. We can also calculate the maximum. So again, looking at our molecules, we have a six molecule and a two molecule. And this is going to have the rule of whoever is the biggest molecule, we're just going to return that two times. So it's going to return a six and a six. Now we get to see a demo. So um, I've done some simulations of this in ClojureScript. And it uses core async. So the important thing about core async is that it enables um, concurrency. Oops, this one actually, that's skipping ahead. OK, um, so each molecule I was saying is, is using core async. So each molecule is doing its own thing. And let me see if I can make this a little smaller so you can see it. And we're going to start it over again. Um, so uh, just a few words that the, when we're doing in code, this is sort of a visual representation. The point of having them in an x and y coordinates is just to help visualization and also to let you know that no, nothing's happening in a particular order. So we have two molecules and a two and a 20. 
and they both bump into each other and they turn into a 20. That's really cool, that's, so that's what we saw. But let's do more, right? Let's calculate the max of 100 using this. All right, this is a little bit more interesting. And um, you'll see the balls actually change colors as they um, kind of coalesce into groups. Oh, and you can actually see the, here's the measurement, it's doing distinct and sort down here. So you can see there's groups of 99 are the greens, and there's a few 90s, there's a 63 somewhere around here that's, I don't know what's he doing. But as they react together, they're coalescing into an answer. Let me see, there's an 83. Oh, I see the 83. He's got to bump into somebody. Get, why is he not? Ugh. All right. Oh, there's, you guys bumped it. And there's one more, a lone 97. Yes! <laughs> so the, uh, the, we calculate the max with these little balls in a gamma programming example, and the answer is 99. So uh, there's other things you can do too. Uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. I'll just show you the primes real quick because the primes are real cool too. Um, so the same, same thing as we were doing before. Um, you can see as they um, react and get together, uh, they start coalescing down to the answer. They don't have the, the cool um, color thing as the max, so I'll, I won't do it too long. But yeah, when I first came up with this demo, I would just like spend way too much time looking at it. I'm like, wow. Anyway, very much fun. Cool. Well, let's get back to the presentation. Where's my clicker? Whoop. There we go. So yeah, so the next thing you guys are thinking about, I'm sure all of you um, are thinking about, is higher order. What if we made the reaction functions molecules too, right? So if we had, if we took that logic, extracted out of our um, presentation, or out of our program, and we took it out, and we actually represented it as a molecule, and reacted those two, what would happen? Like, so the function that we were using, that we're talking about was primes, that has an area of two. If that function reacted with a number molecule, it could capture it as an argument. And because it had an area of two, if that function with a captured now element ran into another molecule, then it would capture it two of them. So this is really cool. So we have a function that has an area of two. It's captured these molecules as it's reacted with them. Now what does it do? And this is a cool thing. It actually hatches. And no, I didn't make up this term. It's actually in the paper. Um, so the function molecule hatches out, and the result is the original function, so it can go run around and um, interact with more things, and a three molecule and a two molecule. So what does this look like in code? This looks almost, ex almost exactly like the other code, but it's now embodied in that molecule. So we have the prime reaction that's now taking an arity of two, an A and a B, and it's doing the same sort of logic if A is greater than B, and if it's a zero, then return A divided by B and B, otherwise return the molecules um, unreacted. The max re uh, reaction, it looks even better because it's shorter, <laughs> but uh, you get taken two, two arities, or arity of two, and then A and B, and then if A is greater than B, return two A's, otherwise, again, the unchanged A and B. So let's see an example of this. Uh, if you have a function molecule that has the max um, higher order and you catch it a 10 and a 4, then it's going to go ahead and hatch and it's going to have the original function, which is the max function, and then two 10s. So another cool thing we, we've seen is uh, we're always kind of taking in two molecules and then resulting in two molecules. And the solution size is pretty steady, it doesn't change. But we can control that solution set size by how many molecules we return. Uh, so if we return less, we could call that a reducing reaction function. So uh, with a max, you would take in two molecules, A and B, and instead of returning the two, you could just return the bigger of the two. So if A is greater than B, you could just return A. Otherwise, you could return A and B. And this works just fine. 
But one of the problems is, um, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. Let's look at the, the max real quick. Uh, so if you have a function and you take in a 10 and a 4, then it would just return that function in the 10. So the problem that I was going to talk about is that, at least when I'm doing it in this visual presentation, uh, it's really hard because you've got to wait for things to bounce and interact together, that it takes a long time and sometimes things don't end up bouncing with each other. So I ended up needing some more stirring in my uh, simulation to get things reacting. Uh, so I added one more rule that you can allow functions to exchange uh, captured values. So what this means is you, if you have two function molecules, one that has something captured in it and one doesn't, and if they bump into each other and react, they can just go ahead and exchange uh, their captured values. And this just does some more stirring and lets things react a little bit more. So yay, demo time. Uh, all right, so let's start off with a small max example. So there's the 20 and the 2, and I'm pointing at my screen, but there's the function molecule as well. And uh, I think the 20 is going to go over here and maybe bump into the function first. And it'll be captured. And it's going to turn fat. Yes. OK, and that's going to capture the 2, and it's going to hatch. Oh, it oh, got recaptured and rehatched. But you can see the result are the 220s. So yeah, you're all saying more now. I want to see more. I know. So let's see the max uh, with the function molecules and have them all explode. So when they hatch, they kind of like explode, because I th thought that was kind of fun. Um, but you can see as they're going along, they are computing. It takes them a little longer to uh, get to the result than the, the other one, because they have to be captured and they do the two capture thing. and then you know, explode and everything. So it takes a little bit more time. But the beauty is, is that we have function molecules like floating around here and interacting with stuff. We only have one function right now, but maybe we could put two. You know, we could go crazy. So, and you can see that it's slowly um, coalescing down to our answer. OK, well, I won't let it run all the way. But, um, and you can do the, and I'm only going up to 50 and not 100 just because with the function molecules it gets a little bit busy. But, uh, so reducing primes, I'll just let this run for um, a few seconds just so you can see it. Uh, so you can see if you let this run a bit that there's less and less molecules um, on the screen. And that's why you would need the little extra stirring. But it's all just great fun. OK. Back to here. My clicker. OK, so what have we seen in these kind of two examples? Uh, well, one thing that really emerges is that there's no sequential processing. And that makes it clear, because these molecules are just bumping around into each other at random. Uh, so that means that there's really no order in things. And that's interesting, because when you don't have sequential processing, uh, you can really start doing things concurrently. And it's important in other areas, too. If you In the keynote, that was fabulous. You know, that was one of the things order um, is, is kind of hard in certain areas as well. Um, so a typical problem uh, for concurrency, which chemical programming can handle quite well, is something like the dining philosophers pro uh, problem. So who here has heard of the dining philosophers? Oh, great, great, a lot of people. Okay, so, um, so another question for you. Well, for, first, for people who haven't heard the dining philosophers problem, so these little circles all around the table, they're supposed to be philosophers, but I can't like draw. So you can just imagine they're philosophers. And the sticks in between them, this is a big question. Forks or chopsticks? So raise your hand if you think it's forks. All right, if you raise your hand if you think it's chopsticks. All right, I'm with the minority. I said it was forks. <laughs> but um, so the, the rule is for the dining philosophers, if a philosopher is sitting at the table and they have um, two 
forks available to them, they can pick it up and they can eat, and they become an eating philosopher. If they only have one fork or no forks, then they need to be a thinking philosopher, and they have to continue thinking until they have forks available to them. Uh, so how do we model this in chemical programming? Well, with molecules, of course. Uh, so a, the F there is a fork. It's a fork molecule. And the TP stands for a thinking philosopher. And the EAT is an EAT molecule. So, so that's saying if a thinking philosopher has two forks available to them and it runs in, it has a reaction with an eating molecule, then it turns into an EP, which is an eating philosopher molecule. Likewise, if an eating philosopher molecule runs into a think molecule, it will turn into and react a thinking philosopher with two forks next to it. So, of course, you want to see the demo. All right. So, um, I can't do graphics very well, so I did them all on the line, but I'm sure it'll be okay. So, if down here at the bottom, here, I'll point with my mouse. Um, you have uh, yellow is an eating philosopher, and then you have TP is a thinking philosopher, and then you have the forks in between them, and uh, the molecules are moving up in a random order here, the think and the eat, and they interact with each other. And they're just having a happy dining experience, really. <laughs> and it makes a cool um, screensaver, too. But it's really fun that you could model such a problem with um, just simple reactions and um, thinking about things as molecules. It's really a cool way to think about things. So back to the presentation here. And with these simple behaviors, uh, we can get some pretty interesting properties. We can combine these simple behaviors and to self-organizing systems. Uh, we see this all the time in nature as well, right? We see uh, ants doing this with ant colonies. We see bees doing this as well. And we, of course, see this all the time in male systems. Well, we will. <laughs> So we could model a male system and have it be self-organizing by using molecule example again. So this time, we're going to have mailboxes. Mailboxes uh, on the mail servers are going to be regarded as molecules. So you're going to have an in-mailbox for A1, and you're going to have on the other side an in-mailbox for B1. And in the middle, you're going to have a network molecule, and then we're going to have a mail message be addressed to B1. So it's going to want to get over to the in mailbox B1. And we're also going to have another couple molecules. <clears throat> These are server molecules. So we're going to have one for the A mail system, and we're going to have one for the B mail system. And then we're going to introduce something new. They're going to be membranes. But the membranes aren't really special. They're just um, they're molecules again, but they're inert. They do not react with anything. And the purpose of the membranes is going to be to separate molecules in a solution. So it kind of controls what they can interact with. So to put this in motion, <clears throat> we have our mail message wanting to get over to B1, and it bumps into the membrane. So no reaction, because membranes don't react with anything. So then it goes along, Mary Ray, random way, and then it bumps into the mailbox A1. There's no reaction because there's a rule there that says it only reacts if it has a matching address and it's not B1. So then it goes on its merry way and it reacts with server A, and there is a reaction here. And it's just got a very simple rule. Uh, A stuff stays on one side, and if you're not that, you just get routed through the, through the membrane partition over to the other side. So cool. It has another simple reaction. Very similar rules. Um, if you're not on the A side, you get routed across the way. And then it heads over to the server B. Again, it reacts. 
shoves it over to the other side, and finally, eventually, it'll bump into B1, and it matches address, and we have the reaction, and the mail was received. So this is really cool, you know, very simple, simple behaviors, um, and you can have a self-organizing mail system. But you can take it further. We can make this a self-organizing and self-healing mailbox or mail system. Um, because these simple behaviors can combine to build resilient systems. So we can introduce another molecule called a crash molecule. And this bounces around, and whenever it actually meets a server molecule, it'll react with it and turn it into an unha unhappy, inactive server molecule that will no longer um, react with things or react with the mail messages. But happily, we can have a sentinel fix molecule that is patrolling the area and just randomly, if it reacts with an inactive server molecule, it'll turn it into a functioning server molecule again, and it can repair it. So, wow, let's see it in action. Mm. All right, I'm gonna start this. I'm gonna make this big enough. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there's a couple crashes. Uh, there's some B messages over here. Oh, sorry, there's, a, yeah, there's B messages over here that wanna get over here. And they're being routed through. The A messages are trying to get over this way. Uh, oh, uh, so these two are down. Eventually when this fixed molecule gets over, that it'll fix something. Yay, it repaired it. Uh, there's one more crash over here waiting to happen. Uh, and, but we can see actually that we did actually receive some mail. We got two mail, mail messages in A2 already. We got one mail message in A1. We just got oh, a couple more went into B, B1. So stuff is happening. <laughs> right, spam. But yeah, so this is, this is just a really cool way to um, think of things. And again, it's all just combining these very simple reactions that don't have any order to them uh, that are actually self-organizing and doing a interesting, I think, behavior. And I was late for dinner a couple times just watching this. <laughs> I was like, oh, I gotta wait till the mail messages get in. But yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all just pretty cool. All right, let's stop watching it. <laughs> I can be mesmerized. Okay, so what did we learn about um, this, or what did I learn about this in um, my kind of explorations of the papers and this space? Well, there, there's a few things, right? I mean, uh, the, the chemical programming is all about reactions, and it, it's really kind of a nice way to get to the heart of the things, get to the heart of, of the logic that you're trying to do uh, with these things that are reacting. It kind of makes it very simple, it makes them simple and elegant. So I think that's got value uh, in itself. The, I think the most important takeaway that I got from it is that it really eliminates this incidental sequentiality that we do every day. I mean, most of our programming languages, we have lists of things, and we traverse the list, and we traverse lists in an order, and we loop over things. And I think we're so used to it that we forget about it. It just becomes invisible to us. And it's nice to step back and think, do we even need that? Do we even need that um, sequencing to do our job every day? Is there another way to think about it and take that out of the picture. And I think this can be important um, because when you take this synchronology out, you can really just open yourself up to concurrency, which is important in many places now um, today. So I think that's a real important takeaway. And also that these simple behaviors, they can combine 
And you can really make robust systems with this. We saw this in a, a simple example with the mailbox uh, that, again, they were just molecules, they were moving around, but eventually they got to the right place that they were supposed to go, they self-organized them system, and you could make them robust by uh, having other molecules that are standing around ready to fix things if things go wrong. They don't have to have knowledge about anything else going on, they're just doing their simple behavior. And this, of course, is, you know, we didn't make this up. <laughs> this is all taken from nature, and this is what uh, is doing what this is what nature is doing at, within us and around us all the time. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn um, from nature and take and bring over to the systems and the tools that we build them with it. So thank you all. Um, if you're interested, I have all the code for these examples out on my GitHub uh, along with the, the demos. So feel free to you know, explore and um, use the ideas. So that's it.